Welcome to the third episode of Equation Stripped, where I take the most important mathematical equations and then strip them back layer by layer so that anyone can understand. This time, we're looking at the brainchild of Sir Isaac Newton and German mathematician Gottfried Leibniz, which is calculus. And this equation tells you how to calculate the rate at which a quantity changes whether that's over time, whether that's over distance, maybe you change pressure over change of temperature. You can change any variable and you want to know how your quantity will change as a result. The first layer is why this equation is so important. It's possibly one of the most important areas or equations in all of maths because calculus is how we model the universe. So all of your mathematical and laws within physics that we use to model behaviours that we see, to model forces, to model what's happening in the universe, they all rely on calculus and calculating rates of change, which is exactly what this equation tells us how to do. So without knowing this equation and how to work things out, we'd have no relativity, no quantum mechanics, no theory of gravity. Every single physical law you can think of pretty much relies on a differential equation. And without calculus, we have no differential equations. So it's fair to say that without this equation, we as scientists would not be able to model the universe and understand the universe in the way that we currently do. For our second layer of the calculus equation, I'm going to give you a concrete example of what the equation actually stands for. So in general, it's telling you the instantaneous rate of change of a quantity, which sounds quite abstract. So the best way to think of this is in terms of something like speed, because speed, as you will know from your speedometer in your car, if it's in miles per hour or kilometers per hour, it's distance per time. So speed is distance divided by time. And to work out the, the speed of say Lewis Hamilton as he does a lap of an F1 circuit, you could just measure the distance around the entire circuit and the time it takes Lewis to do one lap. And then do distance divided by time gives you the speed. So say it's 100 miles an hour. But we of course know that at different points around that circuit, Lewis Hamilton is not going 100 miles an hour. That's like his average over the whole circuit because there might be a hairpin turn. So he's going go maybe 30 or 40 and then along the pitch straight, maybe he reaches 200 or something. So his speed is constantly changing. And if you want to know the speed at exactly one point in time or one point on the track, you need some way of getting that instantaneous measurement. So you might think that instead of measuring the whole lap and the whole time to do one lap, let's just measure the length of the pit straight and the time it takes him to do that. Or let's measure the distance he travels over a 10 second period or a one second period. And you would get better and better estimates for his instantaneous speed but you're never quite exactly at that instant in time. You get closer and closer and closer by making smaller and smaller time interval measurements. So 10 seconds, one second, maybe 0.01 seconds. You never quite get there. And to actually get an instantaneous measurement, you have to follow a very well-defined mathematical procedure. And it's like a, a blueprint or like an instruction manual. And this equation is that blueprint, is that instruction manual and tells you how to get that instantaneous measurement. So to get the speed at exactly one point, at one exact point in time, you can work out the speed of Lewis Hamilton. Now we strip back to the third layer of the calculus equation. I'm going to explain what a limit means mathematically because we have this limit function here. We need to know how to take that limit to understand this equation. And to work out the rate of change of a quantity, it's actually the same as working out the gradient or the slope 
of the graph of that quantity. So here we have this function f, and if I draw the graph, say it looks like this u shape, then the rate of change of our quantity, of our function, is just its gradient. That explains how it's changing, so it's slope. And to estimate the slope of a graph, the easiest way to do it is with a straight line, because it's very easy to calculate the slope of a straight line. It's just the height divided by the width. So to estimate the gradient of our graph, what we would do is take a point T and then draw a line up to our graph and that is the value of our quantity F at the point T. Then you increase T a little bit. So if T is time, you go a little bit further forward in time to T plus H, where H is just some small amount. And at T plus H, our function has a different value, as we would expect, because it's changing, and we want to know the rate of how it's changing. So it has a different value, which is f of t plus h. To calculate what the gradient is here, we can estimate it with a straight line. So you can see it's not exact, but it gives you an approximation. And the approximation is simply the height, f t plus h minus f of t, divided by the width t plus h minus t is just h. And you'll hopefully have noticed that that is exactly what's in here. Now what taking the limit as h tends to zero means on a graph is basically this point here, our t plus h, our second point, that's a little ahead of our first one. It just means take that closer and closer and closer to our original point. I'll do an example. If we take this point here, then you would draw your line up, you hit your curve, you go across, and you get a new value for your function. So we now have a new height, and we have a new width, and we can estimate the gradient, the slope, by drawing another straight line. And you can see on the graph that our second straight line is a better estimate or a better approximation of the slope than our first one. So by taking our point closer and closer and closer, we get better and better and better approximations for the slope at this point. And if we go all the way until we hit it, then we get the exact value. And that is exactly what this equation is telling us. It's saying, take your time interval shorter and shorter and shorter until it's eventually at the same time. And as long as you do this in a well-defined mathematical way, you will get the exact rate of change, the exact slope at that point, and you've got your speed. For the fourth and final layer, I'm going to explain each term. So sort of break it down to the finest pieces. So to start with, on the left-hand side of the equals, we have this term df. So d means rate of change, and we want to work out the rate of change of our quantity, our function, f. So for the speed example, we want to know the rate of change of distance. And the dt on the bottom, on the denominator, is what you want to know the rate of change with respect to what. So the d means with respect to, and the t is your other variable. So here it's time, t for time, and again, if you're working at speed, you want to know how your distance changes with respect to time. Now moving to the right-hand side of the equals, we have the, the limit function. So L-I-M, lim, that means take the limit. And taking a limit is a mathematical function. It's very well defined mathematically. There's a sort of various rules you have to follow when you take a limit. And I won't go into the full details, but this bit here, lim, is telling you to do that and to follow those rules. The h arrow zero bit is telling you that your time interval, which is h, is tending to zero. So you're taking the limit as h tends to zero or as h becomes very, very small. Next up, we have the sort of most important part of this equation, the bit we're taking the limit of. And to really understand what this is saying, 
we just go back to the third layer and our graph because it's just estimating the slope. Because if you remember, the rate of change is just the slope. And the best approximation for the slope is a straight line. So the top part of the equation is just new value minus old value, the height. The bottom part is, again, t plus h minus t is h, the interval, the width. And so one divided by the other is going to give you the, the gradient of that straight line. And then you take the limit and you're bringing the points closer and closer together like we did on the graph. So that's it. We've stripped back all four layers of the calculus equation. And now hopefully you have much more of an idea of why this equation is so important in maths and physics. So thank you very much for watching and don't forget to tune in next time. And in the meantime, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at TomRocksMaths and do check out my website, TomRocksMaths.com. Thank you.